Hello, and welcome to this Shoreland Zoning Update. My name is Lynn Markham, and I am the Shoreland Specialist with the University of Wisconsin Extension Center for Land Use Education, located at UW-Stevens Point. The Wisconsin Legislature has made many changes to Shoreland Zoning in the past year, and this three-part video summarizes the changes. This video includes three parts. The first part is an introduction to shoreland zoning and the recent changes to required shoreland lot sizes. The second part is changes to shoreland setbacks, vegetation protection, and impervious surfaces. And the third part is changes to standards for buildings that are located close to the shoreline. The purposes of shoreland zoning include to prevent and control water pollution, to protect spawning grounds, fish, and aquatic life, and to keep the trees, shrubs, and other plants along the shoreline that protect our lakes and streams. We've also learned that shoreland zoning standards protect property values. In lakes with less clear water, waterfront property values are lower. This comes in part from a study of over 1,200 waterfront properties in Minnesota that found when the water was less clear by three feet, waterfront property values around these lakes went down by tens of thousands to millions of dollars. What shoreland practices make water less clear? Rooftops on buildings and pavement close to the water cause increased runoff that carries pollutants to the lake or stream. We also see increased soil pollution and there's no shoreline buffer in place to filter the runoff before it enters the lake. When shoreland zoning was adopted in 1966 by the Wisconsin Legislature, it set minimum standards, and counties could adopt higher standards as they decided what was best for the lakes and rivers in their counties. Counties continued to make these decisions for over 35 years until 2015. After shoreland zoning was adopted in the 1960s, more homes and larger homes were built on waterfront lots, causing increased impacts to lakes. As a result of increased waterfront development and new scientific research looking at how waterfront development affects lakes and fish, many counties adopted higher shoreland standards than the state minimums, as shown here. In 2015, shoreland zoning in Wisconsin changed. The Wisconsin Legislature passed Act 55, the state budget bill, which stated, counties can no longer have shoreland zoning standards that are more restrictive or higher than state standards for any of their lakes and streams. This means that the state minimum standards also became the state maximum standards. Act 55 also included other shoreland zoning changes and became effective July 14, 2015. A shoreline buffer is where soil, trees, shrubs, and other plants along the shoreline are undisturbed. These plants hold the soil in place and filter the runoff to protect the water quality of the lake. They also provide habitat for eagles, songbirds, loons, and other animals. Trees from a buffer that fall in the lake provide preferred spawning areas for smallmouth and largemouth bass as well as perch. What happens when a shoreline buffer is cut down and replaced with lawn? The shoreline bank is destabilized and eroded Soil washed into the lake contains phosphorus, which increases algae growth. Eroded soil also covers spawning beds, smothering fish eggs. Walleye and smallmouth bass are eliminated from lakes and streams when their spawning beds are covered in soil. Less shade leads to warmer water temperatures, and the habitat needed by birds, frogs, and other wildlife is lost. You can see the difference here between native plants and bluegrass. Native plants have large root systems that are 5 to 15 feet deep. White pines and oaks have root systems between 6 and 10 feet deep. Because of their large root systems, they can hold a lot of soil and phosphorus in place, preventing it from eroding into lakes and streams. In contrast, the bluegrass commonly used for lawns has roots that are only 1 to 2 inches deep, so can't hold much soil in place. This graph shows what buffers can accomplish if they're big enough. The distance buffers need to extend back from the water's edge to accomplish certain goals depends on the soils and how steep the lot is. To keep nutrients such as phosphorus and nitrogen out of the lake, we need buffers between 13 and 141 feet deep, depending on the site. 
to keep fecal bacteria, that is bacteria from the poop of goose, dogs, or other animals, out of the lake, we need buffers between 76 and 302 feet deep. A 35-foot buffer, shown by the red arrow, does not keep bacteria from poop out of the water. In many situations, it doesn't keep phosphorus and sediment out of the water and isn't enough for wildlife habitat. Multiple changes were made to buffer standards in 2015 and 2016 by the Wisconsin Legislature. Counties may no longer require buffers larger than 35 feet. 13 counties had buffers larger than 35 feet prior to 2015. The viewing corridor, which is the area where people can walk through to get to the water as well as view the water, was increased from 30 feet to 35 feet in every 100 feet of frontage. Also, the viewing corridor is allowed to run contiguously for the entire maximum width. A county shoreland ordinance may not require a person to establish a buffer on previously developed land or expand an existing buffer. Establishing a buffer can remain an option for mitigation purposes, and if a landowner applies to build an open-sided structure or gazebo closer to the water than the setback, statutes require a buffer to be established. Why do we have shoreline setbacks? These setbacks provide space for the shoreline buffer. They keep the shoreline buffer intact during and after home construction, so heavy equipment can come on the lake side of the home during construction without destroying the shoreline buffers. Setbacks also keep homes and other buildings on stable ground. Prior to 2015, 25 counties had larger setbacks for some or all of their lakes or streams. Shoreland setback standards are now one size fits all statewide. Counties may not require larger than a 75 foot setback. In addition, counties must use setback averaging to lesser setbacks, setbacks less than 75 feet, if two adjacent principal structures exist. Regarding shoreland setbacks, counties decide whether to use averaging to allow setbacks less than 75 feet when only one adjacent principal structure is less than 75 feet back, and they decide whether to use setback averaging to obtain setbacks greater than 75 feet if two adjacent principal structures required to be at a setback greater than 75 feet exist. Impervious surfaces are hard, man-made surfaces such as rooftops, driveways, roads, parking areas, and patios. With hard surfaces, rain and melting snow can no longer soak into the ground. This increases the amount of water that runs off the land, carrying pollutants to lakes and streams. Impervious surfaces also decrease the amount of rain and snow that becomes groundwater by soaking into the ground. This reduces the cool water entering lakes and streams during dry periods. On this slide, you see the results of a study of 47 warm water streams in Wisconsin. When the watershed, the area that drains to the stream, was less than 8% impervious, the researchers found a large number of fish and fish species. More impervious surfaces resulted in less fish. The same trend was found in a study of 164 Wisconsin lakes. When impervious surfaces were over 12%, crappies, perch, northern pike, and largemouth bass were eliminated. Current impervious surface standards allow impervious surfaces up to 15% on all lots and as high as 60% on some lots. Now, let's talk about why more impervious surface results in fewer fish. Impervious surfaces cause rain and snow to run off rather than soak into the ground and become our groundwater. Greater runoff from impervious surfaces lead to larger and more frequent floods during wet periods. The flip side is because the water runs off during storms, it doesn't soak into the ground. This leads to lower stream flows and warmer water temperatures during dry periods, which is hard on fish. Let's talk about a couple other reasons that more impervious surface results in less fish. As you know, a paved parking lot can get pretty hot on a summer day. When water runs off hot pavement or shingles, it makes the water in lakes and streams hotter for the fish. 
Runoff from impervious surfaces carries more nutrients from soil and fertilizers into our waters. This results in less oxygen in the water, which fish need to survive. Researchers have found that in watersheds with over 11% impervious surface, trout are gone. Similarly, northern pike are gone if the watershed gets above 12% impervious surface. Now, a few more reasons that impervious surface results in less fish. More sediments and algae growth make it difficult for predator fish that hunt by sight to find their food. In addition, sediments cover spawning beds of fish, such as walleye and smallmouth bass, depriving those eggs of the oxygen they need. Wisconsin loons are more likely to be found on lakes with clearer water. As shown in the graph, if the water clarity is less than five feet, the likelihood of finding loons is around 20%. Compared to if the water clarity is 20 feet or greater, the likelihood of having loons on a lake is over 70%. Here are the current impervious surface standards. All property owners may continue to keep their current level of impervious surfaces. And for new impervious surfaces in any residential area, 15% impervious is allowed without mitigation and 30% with mitigation. A new provision is that counties may allow higher percentages on highly developed shorelines. 30% impervious without mitigation and 40% with mitigation. Other new impervious surface standards is counties may allow higher percentages on lots with commercial, industrial, or business land uses, 40% impervious without mitigation and 60% with mitigation. In addition, impervious surfaces are not counted towards the percentage if the runoff from the impervious surface is treated by a device or system or discharge to an internally drained pervious area on or off site. As you can see, these impervious surface standards for residential and business uses are well above the 12% impervious where largemouth bass, northern pike, crappies, trout, and perch are eliminated. Thank you for joining me for this shoreland zoning update. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me, Lynn Markham, at the email shown below.